All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Holly Fiorella, Director of Marketing, Phil Murphy, uh, CEO, Founder, and President of Call Potential. Uh, today, we're going to talk about starting your own call center and how an operator with 10 locations started there. So Phil's going to kind of take the lead here. Uh, he's the operator in question. Phil, you want to uh, introduce a little bit about yourself and your operations? Yeah, sure. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for hopping on. Uh, Phil Murphy, for, for those that don't know me, I'm not only the call potential side, but I'm an owner operator as well. I've been in the industry for you know, about 20 years and uh, I own and operate 19 stores. Uh, I started my own internal call center when I was at 10 stores. And so we're really going to talk a lot about kind of what went into that, uh, you know, how that has kind of impacted the way we operate, uh, how that's impacted some of the opportunities that we have. Uh, but then also really kind of starting off with saying, uh, you know, hey, here's the problems we ran into. You know, some of these might be problems you guys are having. Some of them might be problems uh, that you're anticipating coming across uh, soon enough. But uh, I'm going to go. Okay, so everybody should be able to see my my screen here. Um, so what it really came down to is like a, like I was talking about. We're going to be really talking about how I went in, internalized my call center, and and how I I kind of approached that. So really looking at the next door storage aspect of that. You know, as I said, we're at 19 stores right now, but we started off at 10. And, uh, you know, as part of that, what we really found is we were going through and, you know, we were using a, a lot of the third parties uh, that are out there. You know, I, I think, you know, many of them that, that serve the industry and we've been through, you know, everybody even, you know, phone smart, which is no longer a, a call center uh, anymore. And, and uh, really found that for us, the, the key thing, you know, really kind of the, the thing that we were was kind of our, our our secret sauce was how we sold and how we presented ourselves on the phone and and the, the third party call center is one of the big things that we found was no matter how uh, how well trained they were and how good they were they didn't I didn't feel they could sell as well as my own store teams could and so how do I take ownership of that how do I take control of, of, of that sales pipeline and so what I ended up doing is I went off and I, I really kind of started analyzing you know, what's going to the call center? Where are they, they, they helping us? Where are they, where, you know, where are the calls that they're answering? And what I found was most of the calls that were being answered were in the after hours calls uh, that, that were coming in. And, you know, there could be some valuable calls in there and, and really trying to understand. And I, you know, talked to a lot of different people and it was kind of that whole mantra of, of all those calls that are coming in, even one would pay for the, pay for the, what I was doing. And, and at the same time, they were also taking calls during the day, but that was really kind of what I was looking at justifying. And I'm a big data person. And so I went in and started taking a look at uh, the calls that were coming in. And of the calls that, that came in, what I ended up finding was uh, about 87% of the calls that were coming in after hours, kind of that, you know, we close at six, uh, we open at nine. So uh, from basically 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. and from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. accounted for about 87% of the after hours calls. Uh, that were coming in. Now we certainly had calls. There's still 13% out there that are kind of outside of those two blocks of time. Uh, but but those were calls that were you know they they ranged from you know an hour and one minute all the way to two o'clock in the morning. And what I what I found was you know I was going out there and spending some pretty significant amounts of money to have somebody take that call when many of those calls that I found in that kind of 13% window uh, were existing customers, they, they, or they might be prospects who would later reach out to us, or you know, they may be a prospect that just goes away and we don't get. And, and I really started kind of breaking it down to go, okay, how many calls do I have out there? How many of our leads? What was my percentage of closing uh, to, to those leads? And I applied all that to look at it and go, okay, just like I would look at my spare foot or my Google ads or, or really anything else and say, okay, what am I spending for that rental that called me at 11 o'clock at night? And what I found was I was expend, I was spending more than they would I would get on an average length of stay. It could be a couple thousand dollars that I would spend on that rental uh, that resulted from that after hours call. And that's kind of aggregating across all my stores. And so to me, I was like, well, okay, the justification isn't necessarily going to be in the after hours. Like maybe I'm maybe I'm making it up on the on the on the uh, the, the during calls, but it is better to have that, that live voice than it was to, to sit there and, and, and look at um, how do I, uh, you know, then the, the, the go to an answering machine in my mind. I wanted them to talk to somebody. And, and that's, that was another value that was kind of being brought by that call center 
But I also had enough stores that I was sitting there kind of going back and forth going, you know, I don't have all 10 stores engaged in conversations at the same time. And, and really one of the things that that, that really did is it kind of changed, I, I had to change my, my mental view of, of what I saw a call center. You know, a lot of us kind of look at call centers as that, that big cubicle farm in the back of the, uh, in the, in the back of your room. And, and there are many in the industry that are that way. They're, there's, there's rows of people or, or now with COVID, you know, I mean, maybe they're back home uh, doing that, but, but they're, they're more of a dedicated call center agent. At 10 stores, I wasn't really at that size where I wanted to go out and hire you know, multiple people to become those agents because my call volume, I was, I was a ring at the store first, rolled to the call center, and in a ring store first, call center second, if my managers are doing what they're supposed to do, there shouldn't be a lot of rollover into there. What was it about 10 locations that made you consider starting your own call at, operations? At 10, it was more a matter of, uh, you know, I need to take control of this. We see operators coming in even smaller than that. Our, our, I think our smallest is four locations uh, that, that are running it. Uh, but it. But it was really, I had to sit there and go, how do I get the phone call to someone that's ready to take the call? And how do I, along with that, that, that phone call, do I get the right information so that they can handle the call? And, and so really, in my mind, it was needing to, to do that. Now, I happened to be at 10 when I did this. I really probably could have done it smaller. Uh, it just is a matter of how you, you fit it in and, and, and how it fits your operational needs. And you know, I, I mean, especially we're seeing right now with the unmanned aspect, We've seen a large growth in the number of people who are sitting there with smaller and smaller portfolios that are sitting there figuring out like, okay, how do I answer these? So if they're hub and spoking it, so you know, hub and spoke is is you might have two or three locations that don't have offices and you got one central office. Uh, you know, we see that especially if you you got 20, 30,000 square feet in a property, you may not justify a full-time employee. And so it, some people have gone and said, you know, this is our office, these are ones you drive to the office to. Others have gone out there and said, you know what, hey, we're going to be here Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We're going to be at this other office Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, uh, or, or some variation. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, I need to get that phone call in to whoever can handle it. And, and so really what that I had to do is I had to really kind of change my thought pattern and what a call center was. Uh, and, and kind of like I was talking to, call center was really just distributed communications. It's not a call center in terms of the, the cubicle, the headset and, and everything else. It's, it's, hey, I've got 10 stores, 19 now, where I need to get the call to somebody who's not busy talking to a customer or busy interacting with someone else. Because at all times, there's somebody that's sitting around there. So it, what that really did is that mentality allowed me to shift from kind of this 50, 100, 200 store you know, view of, of a call center that had been kind of throughout the industry. It was, it was kind of something only for the public storages and the, and the, the, the very largest operators uh, mm -hmm. to go out and do to much smaller scale that can be out there. What was the first iteration of your, of Nextdoor's uh, call center distributed communications? So, yeah, and that, and that, that goes back to uh, the, the 87%. Uh, that, I was, that I was talking about, looking at those calls, 87% an hour before and the hour after, what I ended up doing was rather than going out and hiring people to be agents, I used my existing store teams. And, and so those store teams uh, were, were ones that were, were able to take one store and shift it to open an hour later. So instead of nine to six, it was able to be open from 10 to seven. Another store that was able to open an hour earlier, so it was able to be open from eight to five. Uh, and so what that did is that gave me coverage on both of my bookends. So I was covering 87% of my calls, but not having to add staff, not having to add, you know, employee cost onto there. Uh, but then at the same time, you know, our peaks are throughout the day. And so I've got other stores that are able to log in during the day. That's really kind of the hours. They're, they're, they're by themselves in those opening hours. But then the other stores come on and I've got more agents so I can handle the, the, the kind of the flow throughout the day. And so... So it was allowed me to, to really kind of have better control um, in, in all that. Um, and then really kind of the next thing that, that came of it is, is as I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there getting calls in, uh, it became very important to sit there and, 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 and protect 
and keep the right people in the right, uh, sorry, get the right, right, right tools in the right hands. You know, one of the things that uh, was always kind of in that, that normal thought of a call center was, you know, I've got my, my Cisco system or, or, or I've got all these VoIP phones and these, this hardware aspect and it's, you know, to, to stand up a call center used to be a million dollars to stand up a call center. And, and uh, you know, I mean, that's why you see them at Comcast and AT&T and, and things like that, because they, they've got the, the demand and the, to, to, to justify a cost like that. Well, well, really what we ended up doing was changing around. So we're sitting there, okay, how do I get my equipment cost down? And so when we're using call potential to run our call center, we're able to do it with a headset we got on Amazon for 40 bucks. I mean, really, if you've got a set of AirPods you, you know, or just a, a wired you know, microphone, uh, microphone and uh, you know, earpiece, you, you can operate off that because all you need is a laptop or a computer, an internet connection, and some sort of uh, microphone, and you're, you're all set. Uh, so that really kind of cut our cost of infrastructure down. But then the more important thing was, was how do we get the data? Uh, to to the the customer. So if I if somebody calls my my Naperville location and uh, there's nobody able to answer the phone, it, it's going to roll into my call center. Well, that, that call center might be in Peoria, uh, and and Peoria they've never been to the property in Naperville. They don't know the property, and so it was very important to sit there and make sure I've got all of the data that's available. So like you can see up here, this is this is an example of one of our script cards uh, that that's on this on the screen. But it's it's basically being able to pull the the script out. You know, what are they saying? What are the amenities? What are they talking about? What's my unit availability that you can kind of see in the bottom right corner? What's my pricing and specials and things like that? And, and then, you know, just a variety of other things. And so like, this is Jim Smith coming in and, and he's an existing lead. I know that uh, coming in. So I'm not going out there trying to, to figure out like, oh, they're, they're starting from scratch. Because that was always one of the things I always had a hard time with the, the third parties was every interaction was a new interaction. And then so instead it wasn't a continuation. It wasn't a, hey, you went to my website and made a reservation. Did you just need directions and said, everything's got to be captured. They've got to go through everything again. And it, and it makes what could be a two minute conversation into a 10 minute conversation. Mm -hmm. We're re-entering everything that's already there. Because that's the other thing is, is it's very important uh, to, to kind of protect those, those agents because your largest cost in a call center is typically your people. And if you're not using technology in there to, to kind of keep them on the high value thing. So, so for me, like sales is the most important thing they're going to do. And so we utilize our, our call routing uh, system. Uh, the call routing system would sit there. Uh, we have something called the smart route. So when somebody calls in, we know if they're a customer. If they're an existing customer, they become ineligible for my call center. They don't want my call center dealing with existing customers. I want them dealing with rentals. Or if they're delinquent, we're going to automatically route them to a pay by phone. So again, I'm protecting the time of my agents. But then the other part so, of it is, go ahead. Uh, just the way that your call center is laid out, it might be helpful if you talk about how the difference between your agents and the locations and what kind and what calls are triaged where. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm calling them agents, but the, the agents are our store level employees. Uh, they're, they're store managers, assistant managers, you know, whatever, whatever happens to be there. So they're not agents. They're just everyday person. So the, the other thing is, is, they're very familiar with our policies. They're very familiar with our, our product and you know, how we sell. So I'm not out there having to train somebody specifically. They're doing this every day for their own store. So it's much easier to, uh, to uh, uh, pull things in uh, otherwise. And so you know, that's always kind of a nice, nice aspect uh, to, to the whole thing there too. But yeah, no, so I, sorry, I'm going to pause my notifications today. <laughs> pause my notifications, it seems. And where is it now? There we go. All right. No more, no more notifications. <laughs> uh, so, you know, the, the, the call routing side of it was, you know, it, it, important to kind of keep people away that I, wa I, di I didn't want at the call center. Now, we have other operators that we know that they want those service calls coming into the call center, especially some of our unmanned uh, you know, locations, or sorry, unmanned operators, they use both sides of that coin. So they'll have sales concentrated agents, they'll have service concentrated agents, or they may just have be the same people and then they prioritize them. So that was one of the things in there is being able to sit there and queue different people, have different queues, have different priorities. So 
if I've got somebody waiting in a service queue and a sales call comes in, they skip the line. You know, kind of like when we're talking about going to Disneyland, if I get that genie fast pass, they're moving mm -hmm. right, up to, right up to the top. And it's a matter of what do I consider important? One of the, one question from the audience is about smart route and how are you how are you routing? Is it by the number they're calling from or what criteria? Yeah, we look. You know, there's a number of different things we look at, but uh, but you know, when they're coming in, we know if we've seen them before. Uh, you know, whether they're in your PMS, we know if they they're already been in call potential. We know if they're a previous caller. Uh, we know a lot of different ways we've touched this person. Uh, and so then we can decide what do we do with them and, and how they are. And I, I've given a couple examples of how we allow you to differentiate, but there, there's some other ways as well. They can sit there and go like, okay, I want you to do this with that person. I want you to do that with that person, because that is always one of the biggest things. And we're going to get into it in a little bit, talking about uh, SLA service level agreements in terms of how do I know if my call center is doing well? And the biggest thing we end up seeing is, is inundation into a call center where people haven't properly planned to protect those agents so that they're on high value items. And, and, and the routing and, and eligibility is a big part uh, of that. Because otherwise you could end up needing double or triple your, your, your personnel levels if you don't use the right tool. So like we'll see a lot of people that'll go out there and, and they'll just use a, you know, a, a Ring Central or something like that, something off the shelf. And mm -hmm. they'll, they'll just put it out there to say, Hey, I'm just, I just want my phone calls to be routed in so they can answer them. When that happens, they end up with a large volume of calls and it ends up being a lot of the total cost of ownership ends up being significantly higher because they're having to have staffing or they're having a large volume of unanswered calls because they're not able to staff at the level that they, they need to. Cindy asked what platform you're using, site link, storage. Oh, for my for my own uh, uh, PMS, I, for my own, I use Sitelink for my stores. Uh, but you know, we see it across all of our you know all, all of our platforms. So you know, we're I think we've got about eight integrations. So most of the major uh, property management systems we integrate into. And and the, the one thing is is the 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 whole user interface to it is universal. And so we actually do have some operators that use multiple property management systems. And so the nice thing is is from your agent standpoint they don't necessarily need to know how to use SiteLink or Storage or, or uh, you know, Self Storage Manager or, or any of those or Yardi. It all comes in as the same view. So if my store team is using Yardi at one location, but the, the SiteLink is at the other one, it comes in, they don't know any different. They don't need to know what the property management system is. The, the, the call center platform may, makes it agnostic to them. Where the off-the-shelf solutions um a challenge in terms of integration? Is that why you were trying to build your own solution for that? Yeah. So, I mean, you can patch together a lot of different things, but, uh, and, and we've seen operators do that where they've gone out and they said, you know, I just want the phone to ring. And so maybe they just talk to Comcast and have call forwarding going into a cell phone and there's no queuing or, or different things like that. Uh, but, but really what ends up happening is then you've got a laptop sitting there and you've got SiteLink installed. And if anybody start, started up uh, there, the, many of the property management systems, it takes a while to get the data to load. And so again, that may not see, well, it only takes a minute or it only takes two minutes. But if you're adding two minutes onto every single phone call that you're on, that's where I'm talking about that, that leveling up. You're, you know, you're, you're saving money on technology, but you're paying triple on personnel that are having to use it as well as the poor customer service that, that the, the, the caller is experiencing because they're sitting there waiting and, the, and the, the agent's going, oh, you know, it'll just be a couple of minutes. You know technology, they got to come up with all their little jokes to explain as to why they're having to sit there and wait so long for, for the, this agent to get them information or the, the, or the manager. And one more question um, from the audience. Will payments received by the pay by phone get updated on the customer ledger in the PMS? Yeah, so, so, every, so within... The call potential suite, whether it's on the lead side and entry or the, the customer side and notes and payments and things like that, um, all of that goes directly to your PMS. Every single PMS we integrate with, you can process payments, you can do auto pay, you can add notes, you can, I mean, all the kind of the, the, the common things that you would do. Uh, but yes, uh, it uses your property management system's payment gateway as well. So you're not going to have a separate payment, you know, um, credit card processor that you're having to reconcile. 
when it shows up in your property management system, it's exactly the same as, as if they would have paid on your website or would have paid, uh, you know, walking into your store. Great, thank you. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing is that's really important too in the technology side of it, we've really shifted. When I started at 10 stores, uh, we were really driven to you know, come into the office, come see the product and all that. Well, the last two years, especially with COVID, uh, we've really shifted to rent over the phone. And so, you know, some of the important things that we're able to do uh, is you're coming in, you're going through that entire rental process. So the payment you asked about, that payment's being handled, the gate provisioning and, and coding is all being done, but then even the e-sign. So I'm able to sit there as an agent, I can text you or email you your, your e-sign link, I can get that back, I know you signed it, and finish out that entire rental without them coming to the office. Because especially a lot of our operators, or, sorry, a lot of our customers now don't want to interact. They, you know, even COVID or not, it may not be COVID that's driving them, they just want to be left alone. They, they, they want to do this remotely. And so what we found is if we can make that available, it not only increases our likelihood to close, because I run it on the phone, I'm 100%. If I tell them to come in, I might be 50. And so it's, it's one of those where our percentage of close is much, much higher being able to, to do that. And it also means they're not going to accidentally pull into my competitor who might be three doors down uh, and, and otherwise rent from them. So rather than um, having to take a message or forward to other locations, you're able to complete the move-in regardless of what location they called from. Yeah, well, and, and that's another thing. You know, within well, we have we have uh, concentrations in different areas. So uh, you know, there might be three or four stores in, in a geographic area, you know, geographic served area. And so we'll have that often where somebody will call, uh, you know, within. An area and say, oh, you know what? Hey, I, I, I needed a climate control. Well, well our, we don't have any climate controls. I've got one over here at my sister property. But the, the problem is, is many times we have to sit there, you know, we used to have to say, oh, here, let me give you their phone number. And then you hope they hang up and call the right place. Mm -hmm. But instead, within call potential, our, our agents are able to easily just pull up. Because remember, all that data is there at their fingertips. They just change over stores. And they're now in that other store. Two seconds later, they've got their inventory and their pricing and their location and their amenities and, and all that stuff. So they're able to handle them seamlessly and not end up with just a, well, call us back at this number and, and hopefully you, you, you get somebody. And they can even process a payment or rent a unit at a store they're not even at. Hmm. Uh, Ken wants to know if you are covering calls 24 seven and if you are, where's the cost benefit um, to cover calls 24 seven rather than 27. Yeah, and, and, and Ken, we're not. Uh, so uh, call potential is just software. We enable that. However, in next door storage, we don't. And, and kind of going back to when, uh, if, if you had kind of caught the, the earlier conversation, uh, you know, we were looking at about 87% of our calls. Uh, so here I can, let's see. So about 87% of our calls we found were coming in in the, in the hour before we open and the hour after we closed. And so what we found is, is as we were looking at those calls, it didn't make financial sense. So look at how much you're spending on a 24 hour window and decide, you know, maybe it's not an hour, maybe it's two hours, maybe it's three. Where do your call, because we looked at a year's call volume and said, where are the calls? It's up to you, where is, where's your bang for your buck in terms of staffing? However many hours you think you need to staff. For us, it was an hour. For you, it might be two. Uh, for you, maybe 24 hours makes sense, uh, you know, but it's, it's what's the cost in order to do that. For us, we found that the volume wasn't there to justify the cost. Uh, but, you know, if you're looking at 24 hours, third parties might be the right way to go. It's just what's your operational uh, decision in there. Uh, so kind of going to the next thing. So this is all well and good, but you need to be able to measure. And, and so, you know, one of the things that's going to be important in, in any call center that, that you're, you're, you're putting together, you're going to want to make sure that you're able to, to measure uh, performance uh, on there. And you're going to want to be able to see, like, how well is it working? Zoom in here so this is a little bigger. Like, you can see here, this is, this is a, a call center uh, dashboard we're looking at right now. Um, and you, you want to be able to see, you know, how many calls are coming in. Now, this is a larger call center. Uh, than, than, uh, than, than my own stores. But you're gonna really wanna look at kind of some common stats. You know, how many calls are waiting in queue? How many, uh, you know, like right now we've got three calls in progress. We've got one that's in queue. We've got an SLA. So an SLA is saying like, 
I want to answer every call within 15 seconds or if the person hangs up in less than 15 seconds. So any, anyone that's less than that, that's within my SLA. And so we can sit there and see 87% of our calls are being answered in that SLA. And so what that are means- Are you is, setting what the, the 15 seconds? Is that a variable or? Yes, you can set that. So you're gonna have an answer threshold and an unanswered threshold. They don't have to be the same thing. So for me, uh, I happen to have 15 seconds uh, as my threshold, but you could make a 10, you can make a 20. Um, and, and it's really just deciding where that is because obviously the longer they're on, the more likely they are to hang up. Uh, so that, that can be very important in there. Um, then agents, you know, we got 12 agents on and what statuses are they in currently? But, you know, I, I was talking about uh, kind of breaking this down into queues. And so we really look at service queues and sales queues and Spanish or French or, or, or different things like that. We have multiple different languages, but really wanting to see you know, what do our volumes look like? How many agents are on? What's our queue time? Time to answer. Um, and then average talk time. This is one I was talking about. And you'll see the difference here. We got a two minute average talk time on sales than a four minute average talk time on service. We're spending a lot more time on service. Okay. And so not only if we have more service calls coming in, but when we're there, we're, we're spending more time on it. So we want to figure out how we staff accordingly to where we dedicate people. And then like looking down in here, we can see, you know, 7% of our, our sales calls were abandoned. 3% uh, of our service ones are, were, were abandoned. So you know, do we need to change around our prioritization? You know, in this this example, they, they might be the same priority. We may want to have a higher priority on sales so that we're not having the abandonment rate. Uh, yeah, going I on. agree. So this is probably going to go hand in hand with this image and also your um, background knowledge. Um, but Ian asked, from an operational standpoint, what do you see as staffing requirements per unit or per store from the call center side? Yeah, so a lot of that's going to depend on how you operate your call center. Um, so, you know, there, there's kind of some things that we've seen in rules of thumb, but, but if you're doing a first ring, so there, there's people that decide, you know, they want every call to go to the call center. That's going to be a much higher staffing demand. Uh, if, if instead you're doing the same model that we're doing in our stores, which is a store first, uh, it's going to be important to look at how many, what kind of rollover you're looking at. You know, how long are you planning to ring at the store? If they're not, if it doesn't get answered at the store, uh, you know, how many, um, you know, are, are you, how long are you going to go to for, for a call center? Are you going to keep uh, lead customers away? Are you going to keep payments away? All of those things are going to play into it. But all of those things, the way we operate, uh, you're about one person for every 12 to 14 stores in terms of, of needing to, to operate that. When we started with 10 stores, we had two managers that were doing it, in essence, a, a half FTE. Uh, within there. So which, between those two stores, you had about equal to one person. Where we're at right now with 19 stores, we've got basically three agent, three store managers logged in at any given time, but they're also operating their stores. So they're coming and going and in and out. So they're not a dedicated agent. So really that's kind of in that one to one and a half when you get to that 20 store uh, range that you're, that you're, you're utilizing. And a move-in question from Ben. Are you requiring an image of the customer's ID to rent? How are you obtaining this with over the phone rentals without needing to ask them to email it, hoping they'll actually do so? Yeah, I, that really comes down to an operational uh, decision. It, it's the same way with your website rentals. So if you're going to doing a website rental, how are you doing it with that? You know, somebody, or, or if you're deciding you're not going to rent over the, the website, what we'll find a lot of it within my own source, we run on the website, we run on, on, uh, on the, um, the, over the phone. So we ask them to bring it in after. If they haven't brought it in within, a, within a, a few days, then we'll go out and we'll deny them access. And, tell, and, and you know, the manager's show, following up normally to, in order to get that. But if we don't, then we take action to, to make sure that comes in. For you, it may be not allowing them to move in until they provide it. It may be allowing them not to have it. It may be them emailing or texting it, but it really comes down to what's your kind of operational requirement around there. Uh, but I would treat it the same way you do with website rentals. So, you know, kind of rolling in here, seeing you know, here this, this callback functionality. Uh, so this callback, what this, this really is, 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 you know, if you're waiting queue too long. And so this isn't really going to probably be as, as needed here because our wait, wait times are 14, 11 seconds. Uh, but if you've got a call center and you're not able to staff it at a high level, you know, you may have an SLA that's a 
but you can, you can, you'll see a higher utilization of callback, which is, hey, press, one, press uh, nine if you'd like to, to be called back, and then we'll call you back as soon as the, the queue is. And then it comes into the agent. So if they're overwhelmed with service calls first of the month or, or whatever it is, you can then have them get called back later on in the day when things slow down. Uh, so, so that's always been kind of a nice thing, especially for lightening the, the service load. And you can turn that on and off depending on the type of calls. So we may enable it for sales calls. We may enable it for service calls or we may enable it for both. Um, but then, you know, really going in and looking at agents and so seeing like, you know, here's all my agents that are on and, and just kind of gamifying the top five agents who's answered the most calls and, and who's got the highest answer rates and 96% of calls are being answered here to 90%. And, and then going, breaking it down into our agents, what queues they're in and what status they're on right now. So I've got four agents that are ready to, to answer calls uh, right now. So great, I, I can go ahead and and, uh, and no, I'm, I'm probably doing all right staffing wise. Um, and then down here, it's where are my agents spending all their time? You know, I can sit here and see, uh, you know, I've got an hour, uh, I've got a lot of time in ready status. And, but at the same time, I've got 18 minutes, 57 minutes, an hour and 44 hours uh, in on-call status. So that's, that's in how long am I spending talking on the phone? So Gigi here, I've got like, why are you spending four hours on the phone? And so I can come up here and look at Gigi and see her average talk time is eight minutes and 18 seconds compared to everybody else. That's concerning. So mm -hmm. I can go back and listen to Gigi and go, Gigi, you're spending way too much time on your calls. You know, the, the process you're going through is it needs to be short. It needs to be sped up because in the time Gigi handled one call, you know, uh, this is uh, Elwin here handled four calls. And so again, my staffing is impacted by those average times. And so, so I don't want to see long, long times. And then kind of last in here is really just kind of looking at our call distribution and, and uh, you know, where things are, where they're being abandoned. And so I can see calls and agents that are online. I can see abandonment rates and how that's impacted. Then I can see the calls that are going on. So there's two calls that are going on right now. Uh, they're both with unknown callers. I can see if they were a lead. I can see how long they've been talking, what their phone numbers are. Uh, you know, what location they're calling, where they were in the priority queue, various stuff like that. But that, that's all really kind of the data that goes into, you know, understanding what's going on in my call center and, and knowing like, hey, do I, do I have a staffing problem? Do I, am I overstaffed? Am I understaffed? Things along those lines. But that is kind of the dashboard side of it. Uh, and then really kind of, kind of from there, I mean, I guess it's, it's more a matter of if there's any questions, you know, I, as I, as I, as I said, I know we kind of fielded them as, as we've gone, uh, but we've also got, you know, we, we've kind of talked a little bit about what Nextdoor did, uh, mm -hmm. but we've also got this uh, call center um, uh, ebook that's out there. It goes through a lot of best practices. It goes through a lot of things I talked about, but it also talks about a lot of kind of metrics and things that you want to look at and how you might want to approach it. And, and we've talked a lot about the way I've approached it, uh, but there's probably four or five different approaches that are detailed in there. Like, how did you do this? How did you, uh, how, did, how did we see other operators approach this? Because just because the way I did it, it doesn't mean it's the right, it was the right for me, but it may not fit your operational decision. Just like when we were talking about pictures for move-ins, there's different operational decisions you're gonna make in the same context. So staffing is a hot topic right now with getting the right people and bodies um, available to answer the phones. What are some technology, um, features that you are using to kind of help make sure that people's needs are addressed while still scaling back how many bodies you need to have to do that? Well, well, part of it, what we're seeing a lot of is, is implementation of, of their own call center, contact center, whatever, whatever you want to call it, um, is being able to centralize some of those rollovers. So within my own stores, first it was COVID uh, in terms of closing stores down. Then we, you know, difficulty with hiring and retention and, and then just calling in and out on sickness, especially, you know, the beginning part of this year. And what we found was by having the call center there, it allowed us flexibility. If we had to close a store for a day or an hour or, or a weekend or, or whatever. It wasn't a see you Monday. It was, hey, call this number. We roll right in. We're able to service them just like we would anybody else without skipping a beat, you know, because some of the other things in call potential help automate that process. So if I need to roll over, I need to change a call route, you change it at a snap of a finger or a click of a mouse, I guess I should say. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and those calls are routing based off of that schedule. 
So maybe I, I, I'm, I used to be open on Sundays and I'm not anymore and I want to go straight to the call center on Sundays. I may change a particular location from being a location first. On, it's location first on, on Monday through Friday and Saturday, but on Sundays it's call center first. And, and so that, that kind of allows that whole side of it. Uh, we have another question from Ben. Phil, do you feel that your current setup, existing managers acting as your call agents has a limit to it? If you were at 40 to 50 locations, would you continue the same style or would you consider having a designated call center team? No, I, th I think when you get to 40 or 50, that's where you're, you're definitely hitting the economies of scale where it makes sense to be centralizing. Uh, now, centralizing doesn't mean they're sitting in an office. Centralizing can be uh, sitting at home. Uh, I mean, technically, you could be sitting at Starbucks. It doesn't matter. Obviously, a little distracted there. Um, but, you know, as you scale, I, I definitely think the store team, and we're really getting to the point now where we're, we're, out, we're, we're getting to that edge uh, as well. But at 40 or 50, um, can you do it? Yes. I think you're better served uh, having dedicated agents at that, at that level. What, where do you feel that edge is? Uh, I would say it, the answer is going to vary depending on the size of your properties. If, you know, we've seen uh, stores that are 13 stores, but they're large, you know, we've got a Manhattan operator that's 13 stores and they need mm -hmm. to have a dedicated call center agent because of the size of their properties. Where the, the reverse of it, you know, especially with a lot of the unmanned facilities, you know, they might be 10 or 20,000 square feet. So it's not necessarily quantity of stores. It's going to be quantity of units. Uh, and so, you know, I would say in your typical store, if you're, if you're five to six, 500 units a store, uh, you're probably hitting that edge around that 20 to 25 mark. Uh, if you're smaller than that on average, then you're probably going to be able to get a little bit larger. Uh, but it, it, it's, it's really kind of also stem into the call volume you have coming out and, and, and how you're approaching that. But yeah, there's no golden answer. Uh, with a lot of our clients, we sit down and kind of talk over that, you know, and, and obviously coming out of this, if you've got more detailed questions specific to what you're doing, we can certainly hop on. And, and, we, and we talk about that a lot in our, in our kind of sales conversation. Could we try to take a more consultative approach? Say, hey, this is what we've seen others do. At the end, you decide, but we can kind of guide you in best practices. Yeah. He did say that the, it was a loaded question. <laughs> uh, any other questions, guys, while we still have Phil? Um, he's happy to answer them. I always like my loaded questions. Yeah, we will be sending um, out the recording uh, when this session is over. So if you guys came in late or you missed anything, you want to review, we're happy to do that again. Have you had any clients form partnerships with each other where combined they have 50 stores together and then create their own call center? Uh, we, we have. We, we've seen that before. Um, there's, there's a couple of operators that have kind of come up with their own, I don't know if I want to say co-op, but, you know, uh, collection. Uh, we've also seen operators that have gone out there and said, you know what, hey, we're going to do our call center. You know, we have 20 stores and, you know, we're going to go out and offer as a service. Uh, to, to get some to some other people out there and we're gonna we're, they're just going to pay us for that call center. So we've seen a lot of people, a lot of different, it's interesting, the, the number of different approaches to call centers we've seen. And I don't think any of them don't work. It's just they all have different benefits. And, and it just, again, it comes, comes up to an operational decision as to what's the kind of fits the way you want to do it. So you would like to know if all move-ins are completed through call potential. Uh, well, I mean, we have move-ins coming through our website. We have move-ins coming through Call Potential. Uh, but from a call center aspect, yes, all move-ins are, are done through there. Uh, you know, when you got at the store teams, it, it, at our stores, they're done through Call Potential. And then we'll see more mixed bag depending on uh, different operators in terms of where, where they're wanting the, those to be done. Great. All right. Well, I think uh, that's about it. If you guys have any questions, um, you know, contact me, Phil, our email address, phone number is up there. Um, thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you. Again, if you're coming to the conference, let us know. Stop by the booth. Um, come hang out with us and celebrate Call Potential's 10th birthday. Uh, really we're, we're, appreciate we're your buying, time. 
we're buying drinks and food. So stop by the tin roof in Orlando yeah. if you're, if you're <laughs> down there. So drinks on Phil. Let's go. <laughs> oh, shoot. Never mind. Don't come. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, I'm to see y'all. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Phil. Bye, everyone.